Hello, everyone. My name is Jody Kielbasa, and I'm the director of the Virginia Film Festival and vice provost for the arts at UVA. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation with Trayvon Free, writer, director of the Academy Award nominated short film, Two Distant Strangers, moderated by Kevin McDonald, UVA's vice president for diversity, equity, inclusion, and community partnerships. Today's discussion will be archived on the Virginia Film Festival's YouTube channel. And if you've not already seen it, we encourage you to watch Trayvon's remarkable film, Two Distant Strangers, which is streaming now on Netflix. Trayvon Free is a two-time Emmy and Peabody winning television writer, actor, and comedian from Compton, California. He's been a writer producer for many shows, including Adam McKay's upcoming Laker drama, Showtime on HBO, Black Monday starring Don Cheadle on Showtime, and Lena Dunham's Camping on HBO. His other writing producing credits also include The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Any Given Wednesday with Bill Simmons, Larry Wilmore's White House Correspondence Dinner, and many more. He's the writer and co-director of the critically acclaimed Academy Award nominated short film, Two Distant Strangers, starring Joey Badass and Andrew Howard, and currently has projects in development with Paramount Plus, Morgan Freeman's Rev Elations Productions, and most recently sold an Africa-based spy film with Idris Elba and Simon Kinberg that was acquired by Apple after a heated bidding war among the top studios. His writing work can be found all over the web as one of the most sought after young comedic voices on social, political, and pop culture issues. This afternoon's conversation with Trayvon will be moderated by Kevin McDonald. Kevin McDonald is the University of Virginia's Vice President for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Partnerships. He joined UVA after serving as the Chief Diversity Officer and Vice Chancellor for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity at the University of Missouri System and the University of Missouri Columbia. My welcome to Trayvon and Kevin, and you know, I could not think of a more timely moment to have a discussion around the issues that your film addresses. I turn it over to you, Kevin and Trayvon. Thank you so much, Jody. Trayvon, it's great uh, to have you with uh, our broader community uh, today. Um, uh, and I agree. Uh, I, first of all, the, the film, Two Distant Strangers, is incredibly powerful. Uh, so thank you uh, for um, creating this art uh, imitating life. Um, so, so the film represents really the worst kind of groundhog day one could imagine, right? Uh, because it, it tells the story of this black man who wakes up every day and can't seem to avoid getting shot by the police, no matter how hard he tries, no matter what different strategies he employs. Um, tell us a little bit more about the movie, maybe fill in some of the blanks that I've left. And then given that the jury and the Derek jo Chauvin trial is, is currently in deliberation, talk a little bit about how George Floyd's death serves as an impetus for this yeah. movie's creation. Yeah, you know, the the things we were all feeling last summer after seeing that video, um, you know, led to a, a global a global protest in a way that we'd never seen before. You know, I was in LA and I was going out to protest and marches and, you know, I was internalizing that feeling in my own way. And it wasn't until, you know, after a few days of it and, and thinking about and trying to process what I had been seeing and what I had been feeling that <clears throat> in noticing what it felt like to internalize each different story from each different person who had been killed and how you go through a cycle of, you know, anger, sadness, uh, frustration, uh, hopelessness, and then eventually, you know, working your way back to hope with, with each of these stories in terms of trying to find a solution for, for police violence. It, it kind of occurred to me that, you know, that I just had the thought of, you know, this feels like the worst version of Groundhog's Day. And, and, and in having that thought, I, I tried to figure out, you know, what could I do given that, you know, none of us were working last year at the time. And um, I'm, I'm always looking for something new to write or new to, new to produce. And um, I just thought, what could I do with that thought and that idea to create something to convey what I was feeling to people and what people, what my friends were telling me they were feeling. And it was in thinking about how when these things happen outside of a 2020 type year, you hear the story, people uh, talk about it, they post about it on social media. And then after a while, it kind of fades away 
and we go on with our lives. We go back to watching sports. We go back to our, our friends and our parties and things until the, the next one happens. But for black people, we don't forget. There's no gap for us. Like it is, all these things are linked together in a chain that we are in constantly, uh, we're constantly reminded of by virtue of being black, by virtue of we're the ones having to try to protect ourselves from being the next name on one of those lists. And so in thinking about that, it was how could I make Carter this character embodied all of our experiences that everyone could watch, male, female, black, white, whatever the case may be, and you would still go on this journey. You would still feel what it felt like on some level. And, and it was you know, important to make him a character who was easy to identify with on, on an emotional level. And, and that allowed me to demonstrate the absurdity with which we every day juggle trying to put ourselves in the position to avoid police interaction, to avoid uh, a police interaction going bad if we happen to have one, whether it's changing our clothes, going a different direction, like all the different things with which we, we do and the stress that we add to our lives and trying to do those things that you know Carter is embodying and, and it's showing that it doesn't work. It doesn't matter what you do or how hard you try or which direction you go to, to some cop out there, a subway sandwich looks like a gun. And, and once, you're, once your life has been taken, it, it, it's, it's over. There's, there's no redoing that. There's no giving you a second chance. And, and so it was important to me that the film represented those things. And, you know, at the time when we were making the film, you know, people were still, we, we shot this last September, the end of the, the end of September, I wrote it in July. Um, and- During the pandemic, so you- during, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, during the pandemic, which was, you know, a, a major challenge in and of itself, <clears throat> excuse me. And so in doing that, you know, we had no idea this would happen with the movie. We had no idea that its release, but well, even going back to that, we had no idea that it would be acquired by Netflix in March and then would release, you know, during the trial. Like all those things were just happenstance. It was just, you know, it just so happened to align with the experience of making the movie and the energy of making the movie has, has somehow kept it in the front of people's minds and experiences while it's been connected to its genesis, which was, you know, seeing what happened to George. And so in that regard, it's just been an a, a amazing and remarkable experience, but also strange and conflicting to be celebrating the artistic nature of what we've done, the craftsmanship of what we've done with a subject matter that is very present today. Even, even the week voting started for the Oscars last week, Dante Wright was killed. And, and it was an, an immediate reminder of, you know, while for the last few weeks I had been talking about the craftsmanship of making a film and the emotional toll of making a film like this. And then we, we immediately got thrust back into the, to the reality of why we made the movie and the conversation around the movie changed the last week. And so it, it's, been, it's been very, very interesting and very, very, uh, you know, strange to try to balance the emotions of being an artist at this time and who happens to you know we I think we made probably the most prescient current film in the running for any category this year I mean I think we there's no film you can point to where the subject matter happened last week <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right <laughs> and so yeah it's, it's been really really crazy for us in that way yeah and congratulations again on the Oscar nomination. And I also want to encourage those in attendance, if you have questions, uh, we want to definitely open it up for some Q&A. I have two questions I definitely want to get to, but um, please be thinking about your questions and put them in the, the Q&A uh, box. Um, so staying a little bit with um, some of the narrative you just shared, each instance of police brutality in the film is modeled after real instance of it in 21st century America, right? And serving as this powerful reminder of just how many Black people have lost their lives at the hands of police in recent years. Uh, recently, uh, I, I, I've, I've read, um, read where you said uh, that this movie takes a traumatic experience and tells a story of hope and resilience, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I guess my question would be, 
kind of how so, particularly when we think about the recent deaths of Dante Wright and, and Adam Toledo and, um, and this kind of feeling that you're in this never ending loop kind of expressed so vividly in the movie, what, what can and should give us hope in the midst of, the, of this continual cycle of despair? Yeah, so in, when you get to the end of the film, the last like maybe third of it, and you know, Carter figures out you know, what's happening to him. And you know, he's been awakened to the reality of what this cycle that he's stuck in actually means. And, and you know, now the new rules of this particular cycle, you know, the, the last line that he gives at the end of the film is a direct, uh, a direct link to the resilience we bring into the world every day as black people. Every day we have to uh, be work harder, be stronger, be smarter, and, and carry this this weight with us to survive in this country in a way that no other person has to do. And and it's it's the resilience that we have as people, it, which is why you know in the face of what looks like an insurmountable hill of, of combating police violence, of getting police unions to, to change their contracts, of ending qualified immunity, these insurmountable hills, we, we stare them in the face and we say, we will climb, we will summit you, we will beat you. And even when we don't know how, and so in terms of you know, the, the hope that I think Carter represents is when you're watching the film and you are experiencing what he's experiencing. And then he gets to the point where he understands it. And he, he delivers that last line to, to the camera and he walks off frame determined to break the cycle. <clears throat> that is the hope I want to leave, especially non-Black viewers with, which is to say, I've just watched him for 29 minutes struggle with the reality of he can't get out of the cycle simply because of what he is and what he looks like. And now, I've been left with a moment where I don't know what's going to happen next. And so how do I feel as a person? Do I want Carter to get home to his dog? Do I, what can I do to help the real life Carters get home to their dogs? What can I do to help my black and brown friends in my lives, in my life, who's going through these things to, to never have to be in this situation? How can I help? You know, what do I need to learn? I wanted to open a door through that emotional connection for people to, to feel like, oh, this shouldn't happen, what can I do to help? But also to demonstrate to black people that this is who we are. We are resilient in the face of death every single day. We are resilient in the face of oppression every single day. Mm -hmm. And we, it doesn't matter how many times we go through the cycle, you will not beat us. We will not be beat down. We will not lay down. We will not give up. We will continue this fight. If he has to go through it a hundred more times, he will fight the fight until he figures it out because it's who we've been since we've been brought since we were brought here. It's it's the the thing that got us where we are now, which is our determination to never give up in the face of seemingly insurmountable oppression and pain. And so that's the feeling, you know, because I know two different audiences are watching this through a different lens. And I know I don't need to remind black people that this happens to them, but it is a an affirmation of a recognition of your experience. It is in a world where people are telling you police aren't uh, unjustly killing black people and, and gaslighting you to believe that you're the one who's wrong about your interpretation of your experience with the police. This is a direct confirmation of, no, absolutely not. You are right. Look at the list of names that I put before you. Look at what they were doing when they were caught in these situations. You are absolutely right about your experience and you should never let a single person talk you out of it. And so those are the things I was trying to layer into the film in, in that way. Jovan, you, you said something I, I thought was really powerful that uh, I was listening to um, yesterday, right? And kind of talking about um, the, the different narratives that the protagonist kind of took on um, and the different strategies that he employed. At the end of the day, um, you said that there was no way to combat the result of your own behavior, right? And that your message was that that was the point, that it wasn't on us, to change our behavior is on them. And I thought, I thought it'd be just great if you just share a little bit more insight uh, into that. I thought that was a powerful, powerful statement. Yeah, I mean, we, we get told all the time, just comply, do this, do that, don't run, don't do this, do this. And 
at the end of the day, we are the civil, we are the unarmed civilian encountering an armed uh, officer. And yet we are told, you know, we need to be calm, we need to uh, behave, we need to do all these things. And no, there's no accountability placed on the quote unquote trained individual with the weapon. And so what <clears throat> the conversation should be about is, well, what is the armed individual bringing to this, this altercation or bringing to these situations? Because it seems like what we're being told is, look, these guys can be set off at a moment's notice. You guys need to do whatever you can to prevent that from happening. And that just, that is too much pressure to put on any citizen of any country, of any color. That's just not how that should be. And so the conversation needs to be around the training of these individuals, the, the biases of these individuals, the, the way in which, you know, situations they shouldn't even be a part of like mental health calls or, or traffic stops where, you know, we've seen places where people have removed armed officers from traffic stops and the, the use of force and deaths went down by 80% because they weren't no longer being ticketed for a traffic violation by someone with a gun who might who be, be going through who, who knows what. And so I think if we, if we shifted the conversation to where it actually belonged, which is the individual who is supposed to, supposed to be sworn to protect and serve us, uh, yet they kill over a thousand people a year, it, it, is the, it is one of the most egregious cases of victim blaming you could probably find or point to in, in our society where it's, it's on the unarmed 13 year old boy to not run from the armed police officer if he doesn't wanna be shot with his hands in the air. Like those things just don't make sense. And we can't allow that to be normalized. We can't allow that conversation to happen as if it does make sense or if there's a version of it that does make sense. And it's until we get to those places where the conversation is starting there that I think we will see the, mo the most progress uh, through this issue. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, so we have two questions I'm gonna to try to uh, get to here. One from Jen, can you talk uh, about what Murphy stands for? He clearly seems to symbolize more than one officer. What in your mind does he represent? So Officer Merck is a composite of both police officers I've encountered in my life and police officers I've seen in videos, police officers who have been, uh, you know, caught saying the wrong thing on tape or, or doing the wrong thing on video or sending racist email. He's a composite of the, what can happen when you encounter the worst version of these people, right? In a situation, in, a, in an organization that should have no bad apples, right? And, you know, his behavior is a direct tie to, you know, in 2013 or 2014, there was a report that came out in New York uh, uh, about the rate at which stop and frisk was failing. And in that report, there were, there were audio recordings of police interactions uh, stopping people on the streets uh, for stop and frisk. And one of them actually plays out fairly closely to Merck and, and, and Carter's first interaction with the backpack. And, um, and it's in thinking about those things because I knew Carter represented more than one person. And it was imperative that Andrew's character represented more than one person because we know for a fact through FBI investigations, through you know just being caught, there are a lot of cops out there. Uh, and by uh, when I say a lot, you know, of the tens of thousands of police officers, a hundred bad cops is a lot. Even if there's a if there's a hundred bad cops is a lot, if there's 50 bad cops, that's a lot. And it we know that there are people out there who have racially motivated biases towards the way they interact with our community. And so for him, he represented all of those people, the, the, the behaviors that we're trying to get rid of. And so when it came to, particularly the end of the film, you know, when he's in that last interaction with, with, with Joey, with Carter, that moment of knowledge of what he's doing the forethought in which we, he did it with was born of the fact that last year I saw the photo of the officers who took a selfie where they killed Elijah McClain. And when I saw that story and I saw that picture, 
it represented to me the most evil, inhumane thing I could I could imagine coming from a police officer where you celebrated the murder of a child. You killed this young man and you you like that's what you do after you win a, a, a football game with your friends. You know what I mean? Like are you like you don't celebrate the murder of a young man. And when I thought about, you know, who who could do a thing like that? Like how do you go home to your family with that type of heart and and be a loving person? Um, that's difficult for me to comprehend, to understand how someone can be the can be those two things. And part of it in understanding it was <clears throat> in talking to my friends who are police officers, when you put that uniform on, it changes you. You you can you can walk into the door of someone and when you put the uniform on, it changes you. And and I know that from you know listening to them talk and also seeing seeing it play out. And so it was important to me that. Andrew's character represented, you know, something that we need to root out, but that he also, he also had more dimension to him than just a cop who shows up and kills someone. He, he talks about why he became a cop. And I've heard many cops talk about being bullied, being the reason they became a cop. I've had people reach out to me who've said, I've heard like cops said those things to me, you know, to my face about you know being bullied is what made them a cop. And now <clears throat> you have an officer who under that, under the guise of, you know, wanting to root out bullying, he gets to decide who the bully is to him. He gets to decide who suffers the repercussions of his childhood trauma. When <laughs> in actuality, you just need therapy, man. Like you don't need to become a, you don't need to go be, get a gun and go police the streets, you need therapy. And so, you know, that was kind of why, how I colored that character and, and the, the the thought behind it. Yeah, thank you so much. I know we're um, um, close to time. I'm hoping that we can just run a little bit over because we started sure. a little late. Um, no, no, totally. um, um, Margarita has a question here, and then I want to I want to end um, with giving you the last word, given um, and kind of kind of end where we started with the impetus behind the creation of the movie with the um, George Floyd's death with this current trial. So I want you to kind of speak on that for the people. But um, Margarita um, has a question here uh, and just thanks, thanks you for this powerful film and says that the, the fruit uh, vendor woman is a brown ally that films uh, and speaks up every time the police attacks Carter. How can we ensure allyship between all of the underrepresented minorities that suffer from police brutality and racism in this country? I think that's a great question. I think a big part of it is we need to bridge our communities because we are suffering the same fate, Latinos, Muslims, Indians, black people. And when it comes to the police, we are all, we are suffering the same fate. But I think what, what's happening is we are doing it alone. We are, we are insulated in our own communities uh, dealing with the issue instead of recognizing on a more broad scale that it's all of us, that it's, it's something that we need to gather together as a cross-cultural community to find a solution to this problem for all of us because it's a, it's a thing that can't be solved within one individual community. It has to be solved at the level of all of us. And so I think we need to all be better about, you know, when we gather, when we, when we commune, when we organize, we need to be organizing together. We need to also be having discussions about the differences in our community and how it affects us, each individual community differently. Because while it is the same on the surface, there are definitely cultural differences that come into play with how we interact with these experiences and how they affect our communities. So I think, I think we have to start there because it's important that, you know, we get on some sort of same page in order to fight this fight together because there is so much power in that unification. Yeah, thank you. I do want to, Ty puts in here just a really positive note. I, I want to just share it with you. I just, Ty says he just wants to say thank you uh, and say congrats. Uh, he's super proud of you as a fellow Black filmmaker and also from the perspective of someone who also created a film during COVID challenges. 
were unlike normal time. Great job. So I wanted to share that with you. Listen, I, I wish I had a whole hour to spend because I, you know, I, I want people to know there's a cool connection with the title of the film, right? Two Distant Strangers, the Bruce Hornsby Tupac connection with the line of Tupac. You have amazing backers um, for this film from Mike Conley to Kevin Durant to Diddy to Jesse Williams, which just shows the power and the belief and the vision that you have for this community. But I, what, I, what I'd love for you to do is um, for me kind of bring this full circle. Uh, George Floyd's death served as an impetus for the creation of the film. We know that we are in the midst uh, of, a, of the jury reaching a decision um, in, in, the, in the Derek Chauvin case. Um, I'd love for you to just the same hope and resiliency that you had as a d inspiration for this film, maybe just leave those in attendance with um, even in the midst of the angst and fear with regard to this jury's decision, what can we take uh, and be hopeful for and resilient uh, in, in this moment in time? Um, you know, it's, I want us to get to a place where Films like this no longer need to be made, and these stories don't need to be told in the same way. And, you know, George was a very big catalyst for this film. And, um, you know, James Baldwin was also a big part of this film in, in spirit. And, you know, there was also, you know, more of a conversation about that that we cut out. Um, but, I, I think in thinking about James and thinking about this, this situation, you know, one of the things he said is, you know, not everything that is uh, faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And we have a large swath of Americans who refuse to face this problem, who refuse to uh, accept this problem and address it in the way that it needs to be addressed. And and I think the only way we can get to a place where there are no more George Floyds and Breonna Taylors and Ahmaud Aubrey's and Elijah McClain's and the countless other names is that we have to collectively face the problem. We have to collectively want to address the issue. And you know, my hope is that it is my personal belief that Derek Chauvin is guilty of murder. That is my personal belief based off of what I saw and the testimony I've heard. Um, that is my belief. It is, it is my hope that the jury comes to that, that same decision. And, you know, some people have said, well, how can you want, uh, how can you want him to be convicted? Like the justice, if he's, if he's not convicted, that's the justice system working. And, the truth of the matter is it, it, it's not, it's an injustice system and it has been for black people for almost the duration of our time being here. And so it is, it is essentially working in the way that it would have always worked if he's not convicted. But we all know what we saw in the same way, you know, his defense, the prosecution said in, in their final statements, we all know what we saw, believe your eyes. I believe my eyes, but I also believe my heart. And I believe my experiences that I've had in this country as a black American man. And, and I know that no matter what the outcome of, of the trial, that there is so much work to be done to prevent it from happening again and again and again. And, and so I hope that, you know, while this film is, is more relevant today than it could have probably ever been in, in the, the period that we've made it, I hope that it inspires people to, to work. I hope that it inspires people to want to not have to see another one of those videos. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just where my heart is today. I really, really want to never see another mother standing on the street crying because the police killed her son or her daughter. And, um, and I think, I think no one should. I think we all should want that to be uh, over. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's where we'll leave it, Trayvon. I wanna thank you um, uh, for your vision. I wanna thank you uh, 
uh, for in creating a, an incredibly powerful film and then co-directing it in a way that is continuing um, to um, push conversations, um, to keep this at the forefront of people's mind, to keep the dialogue flowing around this important subject matter. Um, uh, and, and I wanna thank you uh, for continuing to kind of push um, this important narrative, this envelope in our country. I mean, we need it now more than ever, but what I really appreciate um, is where for me, I'll, I'll bring it full circle, is the level of hope and resiliency that you have kind of born and bred in the film and that you continue to push um, to the community. I think we have to have something to hold on to and I choose to kind of hold on onto that. And I think it's because of um, um, and filmmakers like you, leaders like you, that I have an opportunity, even when I am, I uh, feel I, I'm at my lowest, even when um, there is another death and I wanna be at despair. It's great to know that there are powerful people like you that are putting out powerful narratives um, that can say, even in the midst of this, our community can come together and, and find hope and resilience. And I wanna hold on to that. I wanna thank the Virginia Film Festival and, and Jody Kibasa for his leadership, for his amazing team, for being able to collaborate and 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 give you a, 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 give us a moment with you, um, we will cherish that again. Powerful film, uh, Trayvon. Thank, thank you. you for all that you're doing in our community. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody, and thanks everybody for watching. And thank you guys for having me. All right. Take care. Take care. All right. Bye now. <laughs>